Ago, the world was shocked to learn that the Muslim terrorist group Hamas had attacked the nation of Israel by sending scores of fighters across the border from the Gaza Strip into Israel. These Palestinian militants infiltrated Israel using pickup trucks, motorcycles, bulldozers, powered paragliders, while others came on foot, and they would not only kill many Israelis, but they would commit unimaginable atrocities upon the Jewish people. Beheadings, rapes, tortures, and taking with them hundreds of kidnapped hostages, including women, children, even infants, and old people across the border and back into Gaza. No atrocity of this magnitude had happened to the Jewish people since the Holocaust, when six million Jews were exterminated by the Nazis. To put this in perspective, based on the population of Israel in proportion to the population of the United States, this attack upon Israel was 15 times the size of our own 9-11. But as shocking as this attack upon Israel was, what was even more shocking to people of common decency and, and common sense was the outbreak of anti-Semitism all around the world, including the United States as thousands around the world marched not only in support of Hamas and their desire for a Palestinian state, but for the destruction of the state of Israel. You see, this chant that has become popular, so popular these days, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, has nothing to do with establishing a Palestinian state alongside of the state of Israel. The goal of Hamas and all Islamic terrorists is to destroy the nation of Israel to wipe the Jewish nation off of the map and turn the entire region into a Palestinian state. In other words, they don't want a portion of the land for a country. They want the entire land of Israel for their country. That's the goal. But in addition to these marches and anti-Israel chants, Jewish people, especially students on Ivy League university campuses, have been threatened and attacked simply because they are Jewish. In late October, a friend of mine who was in London at the time sent me a video of over 100,000 neo-Nazis marching on the streets of London. A cousin of mine who lives in New York said that the Orthodox Jewish men in her community have started wearing baseball caps in order to cover their yarmulkes. Those are the religious skull caps that uh, Jewish, Orthodox Jewish men wear. And they've done this so that they would not be easily identified as Jews and therefore become targets of violence. She also, my cousin, spoke of a Jewish man in her area who was refused service at a neighborhood gas station simply because he was Jewish. And in recent days, there have been several news reports of Jewish people being physically assaulted simply because they are Jewish. In fact, a recent statistic I read said that anti-Semitism in the United States has increased by nearly 400%. Now this morning, in light of the strange turn of events, this anti-Israel and anti-Jewish sentiment that is sweeping the world, I'd like us to see what the Bible says about this and why, as Bible-believing Christians, we must not only stand with Israel and the Jewish people, we must support Israel and the Jewish people, but also we must love and pray for Israel and the Jewish people. This is not an issue that we can remain neutral on. Not if we're true to the word of God. Now, if you're a visitor to Lakeside today, you should know that I usually give an expository verse-by-verse -verse message from God's word, but not today. Today, I've chosen to give a special message on the current, the very current issue concerning Israel and what is taking place there because it's important for Christians to understand these issues from a biblical standpoint. And to all of you, let me say up front that supporting the nation of Israel does not mean that we have to agree with everything that the government of Israel has done. We acknowledge that Israel, like every other nation in the world, has done things that are unjust and wrong. Inequities do exist, as they do in every country. What we always have to keep in mind when it comes to Israel is that although there are many religious Jews who live in Israel and who are observant to the Mosaic law, the nation officially, officially is a secular nation. 
And therefore, its government often makes decisions based on political pragmatism, which means whatever works they do, rather than on biblical values. But before us, as those who love Jesus, those who love the word of God, the issue is this. We wanna know what God says. We wanna know what scripture has to say on this matter. Where does the Bible stand when it comes to the Jewish people and the nation of Israel? What should be our attitudes towards Israel and the Jewish people? So this morning, I'd like us to explore several issues regarding this worldwide crisis of anti-Semitism by considering, first of all, what anti-Semitism is, what it actually is, and why does it exist? And then secondly, to see why, if we are going to be true to the word of God, we must support Israel, we must love the Jewish people. Now, in case you're thinking that I'm a bit biased on this subject because I'm Jewish, you're right, I am. I do feel strongly. I, I am passionate about the Jewish people since they are, as the Apostle Paul referred to them, my kinsmen according to the flesh. But regardless of my ethnicity, I approach our study only with a desire to be fair to the Word of God and to see what God says on this subject. And so I want to lead you this morning in our study, not so much as someone who is Jewish, but as a pastor who is a follower of Jesus Christ, instructing his Bible-believing congregation on what the Word of God says about anti-Semitism and why we should love and support Israel and the Jewish people. So to begin with, I want us to consider the issue of anti-Semitism. What is it and why does it exist? Now, I've used this word anti-Semitism <coughs> a number of times without actually defining it for you. So what, what is this term? What is anti-Semitism? What does the word mean? I recognize that lots of people have been unfamiliar with this word and are only hearing it for the first time in recent days and weeks and months. In fact, many years ago when Michelle and I first started dating, I mentioned the word anti-Semitism to her and she asked me what it meant because she had never heard that term. And my immediate thought was, I'm gonna marry this girl. That's what I'm gonna do. Well, the term anti-Semitism was first coined in the year 1879 by a German agitator, a racist by the name of Wilhelm Marr, M-A-R-R, -R, who used this word to express deep hostility and antagonism towards the Jewish people. The word is actually a combination of two words that are joined together, the first being anti, which means against, and the second is Semite, which comes from the name Shem, who was the oldest of Noah's three sons. Now, although technically, Technically, the term Semitic is a rather broad word that encompasses all Semitic people groups, both Jews and Arabs. The, the term anti-Semitism is strictly used in reference to the hatred of the Jewish people. One scholar defined and explained anti-Semitism with these words. He said, anti-Semitism is religious and racial prejudice and hatred directed against the Jewish people. It is to be distinguished from anti-Judaism, which is opposition to the religion of the Jews, or anti-Zionism, which is opposition to aspects of or the very existence of the state of Israel. Now, while anti-Semitism may be on the rise, I want you to know it isn't new. It isn't new. Hatred towards the Jewish people has existed for literally thousands of years, ever since they became a nation in ancient biblical times. The Old Testament records that from its infancy, Israel has been hated and attacked by nation after nation, people group after people group. There were the Amorites and the Egyptians and the Amalekites and the Assyrians and the Phoenicians and the Philistines and the Babylonians and the Persians and the Macedonians, just to name a few. There were others. And these folks, nation after nation, people group after people group that rose up to attack and harass Israel during Old Testament times. And it did not improve as time went on, as time progressed. Moving into the New Testament era, the church age era, those who have hated the Jewish people have included the Romans, the Islamic fundamentalists, the so-called Christian crusaders, the Spanish inquisitors, the Russian Cossacks, the Nazis, and now Palestinian terrorists. And I might add, the Roman Catholic Church has historically been extremely anti-Semitic. 
In fact, a few years ago, while Michelle and I were in Italy, the headquarters, the capital of Roman Catholicism, we saw in a jewelry store a rather large piece of jewelry in the shape of a swastika, the symbol of Nazism, right in the front of the window, all for sale. And on a personal note, all four of my grandparents, Eliezer and Lena Krilovetsky, Joseph Benjamin Kentorovich, and Francis Levitt, they all emigrated, all four of them, emigrated from Russia to America in the early 1900s to escape anti-Semitic hatred and persecution taking place in Russia. Specifically, what they were escaping from were organized attacks upon Jewish communities in Russia known as pogroms. One authority on the subject wrote this on the subject of pogroms. He said, the pogrom was originated in Russia and is by definition an attack. It is a swift, localized form of brutality which has as its major ingredients looting, destruction, rape, and murder. Pogroms were carried out extensively in Russia between 1881 and 1921. They were not confined to Russia, but were also a weapon employed by anti-Semitic movements in Germany, Romania, Austria, the Balkans, Morocco, Algeria, Persia, and other areas. In Russia alone, during the years of the Civil War, 1,236 such attacks are known to have taken place. The result was an estimated 60,000 dead and many more wounded. But listen, it isn't just nations, it isn't just people groups that have expressed hatred for the Jewish people. Individuals, some who were very well known, high profile individuals, were outspoken anti-Semites. For example, Erasmus, the famous Dutch Renaissance scholar and Catholic theologian said these words. He said, if it be the part of a good Christian to detest the Jews, then we are all good Christians. Richard Wagner, the German composer and conductor said these venomous words. He said, I regard the Jewish race as the born enemy of pure humanity and everything that is noble in it. And Voltaire, the French philosopher and novelist was so mean spirited towards the Jewish people that he directed these hate-filled words towards them. He said, you have surpassed all nations in impertinent fables, in bad conduct and barbarism. You deserve to be punished, for this is your destiny. But it isn't only well-known European individuals who have boldly expressed their hatred of the Jews. Some notable Americans have also been quite outspoken in their anti-Semitism, such as the automaker Henry Ford. According to author Becky Little, in an online article she wrote about Henry Ford, Miss Little wrote this. She said, Ford's essays and booklets helped fuel anti-Semitism in the U.S. and abroad. Hitler was a fan of Ford's anti-Semitic writing, mentioning the car maker by name in its own 1925 anti-Jewish, in his own 1925 anti-Jewish manifesto, Mein Kampf. In 1938, Germany awarded Ford the Grand Cross of the German Eagle, the country's highest medal for foreigners. Ford received the award for his humanitarian ideals and devotion to the cause of peace, like Germany's Fuhrer and, and Chancellor had done, according to the proclamation that Hitler signed. So, anti-Semitism isn't new. Hamas did not invent it. It dates back thousands of years to the time of the Old Testament, and it continues today. You see, the anti-Semitism we're seeing today has always been there. It's just now rising to the surface as people have been emboldened to express their true feelings and attitudes that have always been there. So then the question that we're faced with is why? Why does it exist? Why have the descendants, the physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob been the targets of such hatred and persecution for all of these years? Well, it certainly isn't because they have harmed society. On the contrary, some of the greatest contributions to the arts and sciences have come from Jewish people. Felix Mendelssohn, the brilliant composer, was Jewish, as was Albert Einstein, Robert Oppenheimer, Sigmund Freud, and Jonas Salk, the scientist who invented the vaccine for polio. In addition, it was Jewish men who invented pacemakers and defibrillators, lasers, the concept of stainless steel, as well as Google. 
And there are countless doctors and inventors who have made the world better and safer because of their influence. In fact, David Larson in his book, Jews, Gentiles, and the Church of God, writes this about the disproportionate number of Jewish people involved in education, science, and medicine compared to non-Jews. He writes, Jews are twice as likely to go to college than Gentiles and are five times more likely than Gentiles to be admitted to an Ivy League school. Perhaps that's about to change. Jews are overrepresented in the, in the field of science by 231%, in psychiatry by 47%, in law by 265%, in dentistry by 299%, and in mathematics by 283%. It's very likely if you have a family physician, it's very likely that he or she is Jewish. So with all these positive influences Jewish people have made to our world and continue to make, I ask again, why are, there, are they so hated and so despised? Well, in addressing this question, we have to first recognize that over the years, a number of foolish and erroneous reasons have been offered in order to justify anti-Semitism. Writing about these foolish reasons, one Jewish Christian leader wrote this, he said, what had they done? What was their crime? Why this never-ending persecution? To blame it, as so many have, on the Jewish national rejection of Christ is to acknowledge a total lack of understanding of the word of God. It's the worst kind of anti-Semitism, theological. Some have suggested that hatred of the sons of Jacob was the result of their strange religion. In a day of polytheism, they believed in the one true universal God. Their dietary laws, strange dress, code of conduct, and aloofness from other peoples all serve to make them different and defenseless. <coughs> Others have argued that abrasive character, excessive wealth, and disproportionate influence are the root cause of hatred of the Jews. These are fallacious excuses used as an attempt to justify ungodly attitudes and remain widespread right up to the present hour of history. Sometimes, tragically, even amongst some who bring shame to the name of Christ by calling themselves Christian. So I've brought the big guns this morning. Well, this man is right. He's, he's absolutely right. All of these reasons offered for anti-Semitism are just excuses. They hide the real reason. They obscure the root reason for anti-Semitism, which is, note this, anti-Semitism is satanic. Satan, the archenemy of God, hates the Jewish people, and he is the source of all hatred directed at them. And why does the devil hate the Jewish people? He hates them because simply God loves them and sovereignly chose Israel to be at the center of his plan of redemption by giving birth to Jesus the Messiah, Israel's greatest son, who would be the channel to bless the world and to defeat the devil's wicked intentions. This is precisely the reason that Satan has aroused Jewish hatred and attacked the Jewish people throughout history. It is his futile attempts to frustrate the redemptive plan of God by destroying the Jewish people who are at the center of that plan. And we read about Satan's hatred and his attempts to destroy Israel in Revelation chapter 12. So I'd like you to turn there. Revelation chapter 12. We're going to look first at verses 1 and 2. We read, a great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and on her head a crown of 12 stars. And she was with child and she cried out being in labor and in pain to give birth. Now we read here about a woman who is about to give birth to a child. Well, that's really not new. <coughs> Women give birth to children every day. However, as you can see, this is not an ordinary woman. Woman, And we know this by the way she's described. It's very symbolic, the language. She's described as clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and on her head a crown of 12 stars. See, this is a symbolic description of none other than the nation of Israel. How do we know this? Well, the imagery is taken directly from a dream that Joseph had in Genesis 37, Joseph being one of, of Jacob's 12 sons. 
In his dream, the sun, the moon, and the stars were bowing down to him, to Joseph. In other words, the sun, the moon, the stars, they represented the entire family of Israel. And this dream did become a reality when they did all of them bow down to Joseph after he became the prime minister of Egypt. So if the woman of Revelation 12 is Israel, and it is, then the child that she was about to give birth to is none other than Jesus, the Jewish Messiah, born Jewish. But as soon as this child was born, his life was in danger. And we read about this in the next couple of verses, verses three and four. Then another sign appeared in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns, and on his heads were seven diadems, and his tail swept away a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth, and the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she gave birth, he might devour her child. Now, there's no question as to the identity of this red dragon, because according to a few verses later, verse 9 of Revelation 12, he is the devil, Satan. And later in the book of Revelation, we learn that the seven heads are seven mountains, and the ten horns represent ten kingdoms. And the third of the stars of heaven that were swept away is a reference to one-third of the angels who followed the devil in his revolt, his rebellion against God, and as a result, they were ousted from heaven and thrown down to the earth. So the picture, folks, that we're being given here in these verses is one of Satan and his host of demons standing before the nation of Israel, ready to devour her newborn son, the Messiah. And that's exactly what happened right after Jesus was born. Herod attempted to murder the Messiah by killing all of the male children two years of age and under who were living in the vicinity of Bethlehem. But I want you to understand, behind Herod was Satan. The true source of these murders is he attempted to devour Israel's child, the Messiah. And as we continue reading Revelation 12, we see that he was obviously unsuccessful. Verse 5, and she gave birth to a son, a male child, who was to rule all the nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up to God and to his throne. Now, the first part of this verse, of verse 5, that's a reference to Psalm 2, which tells us that someday Jesus, as king, will rule the nations of the world. And the second part of verse 5, and her child was caught up to God and to his throne, that's a reference to Christ's ascension into heaven, into glory, after his resurrection. So all of verse 5 then omits the earthly life and ministry of Christ, those 33 years. It just goes from his birth to his ascension. Now listen closely. Ever since the earliest days of Israel's history, Satan has attempted to destroy the Jewish people. He tried to destroy them even before they dwelt in the Holy Land by raising up Pharaoh, king of Egypt, who hated the Jewish people and attempted to eliminate them. He tried to destroy Israel when they lived in the Holy Land by raising up nation after nation who attacked them. He even attempted to destroy them during their time in captivity, during the dispersion in the Old Testament through Haman, that evil man during the time of Queen Esther. Haman, a despicable character who tried to slaughter all the Jewish people throughout the Persian, the vast Persian empire. Now, all these attempts to destroy Israel took place before the birth of Jesus. And the reason for this was because Satan was trying to prevent Jesus from entering into the world because Jesus coming into the world would mean a fatal blow to the devil by his death on the cross, which would result in the salvation of his people, something Satan desperately and aggressively tried to thwart. Listen, the real reason that Satan hates the Jewish people it's really not complicated. It is simply because God loves them and God has chosen them to be his covenant people, his treasured inheritance, and who from them came the Jewish Messiah who would destroy all of the evil one's wicked intentions and designs. But now that Christ has come, he's come into the world, he's already been to the cross, Satan's hatred for Israel has not abated. 
It hasn't calmed down. It continues and will continue in the future. And that's precisely what verse 6 of Revelation 12 tells us. Then the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared by God so that there she would be nourished for 1,260 days. Now, while verse 5, as I said, omitted the 33 years of our Lord's life and ministry on earth, verse 6 omits the entire church age. It's just not mentioned here. See, this verse is referring to what will happen in the future, in the middle of the horrific seven-year tribulation period when Satan's representative on earth, the Antichrist, fueled by his devilish hatred of the Jewish people, will turn against Israel and persecute her so that she will seek refuge somewhere in the wilderness where God will preserve her, we read, for 1,260 days, which amounts to the last three and a half years of the tribulation. And then, at the end of the tribulation period, Jesus will return to rescue the nation. But not before, according to Zechariah 13a, two-thirds of the Jewish people living at that time will be murdered. So why will Satan seek to destroy Israel during the tribulation period? I mean, after all, Jesus has already come into this world. He's already gone to the cross. So why go after the Jewish people now? And why go after them in the future? Listen closely. Just as Satan sought to destroy Israel to prevent Christ's first coming, so he seeks to destroy her now and will intensify his attempts to destroy her during the tribulation period in order, watch this, to try to prevent Christ's second coming. Why? Because if Israel ceases to exist, then there there is no people. There's no people for Jesus to return to rescue, and all of God's promises to the nation then fail, and God is shown to be a liar, which is exactly what Satan has always wanted, to discredit God. Remember in the garden, hath God said? Listen, the root cause of anti-Semitism is that Satan despises Israel. They are God's treasured inheritance, God's channel to bless the world through his plan of redemption and the nation which gave birth to Jesus, the devil's arch enemy. (coughs) So understand that all the anti-Semitism that you see going on today, it's being fueled by Satan. Those who have risen up against Israel and the Jewish people are merely pawns in a spiritual war they know nothing about. They're not aware of this. They are being manipulated by demonic delusion and they will continue to be manipulated by demonic delusion. But as Bible-believing Christians, we, we know the truth because we have the truth. The truth is revealed in the Bible. And if we are true to God's word, then far from hating Israel, far from despising the Jewish people, we can't even remain neutral here If we're to be true to the word, we have to love them, we have to support them, we have to pray for them, we have to stand with them against anti-Semitism. So for the remainder of our time together this morning, I want to give you several biblical reasons as to why, according to Scripture, we must love and support Israel and stand with the Jewish people. With the first one being this, because God loves Israel and the Jewish people. I know I've said this, but I want to develop this. It's really as simple as that. God sovereignly chose to set his affection upon the Jewish people, and he called them into being as his unique nation, his covenant nation, whom he loves, and he's promised to bless like no other nation, and therefore, whatever God loves, we are to love too, just as whatever God hates, we are to hate. We must hate anti-Semitism because he hates it. We must love Israel and the Jewish people because he loves them. Deuteronomy 7, verses six through eight, a foundational verse on all of this says this, God speaking to Israel. For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his own possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love on you nor choose you because you were more in number than any of the peoples for you were the fewest of all peoples. 
but because the Lord loved you and kept the oath which he swore to your forefathers, the Lord brought you out by a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Now notice the reason that God gives for choosing the Jewish people to be his, his own treasured possession. Out of all the nations, all of them, on the face of the planet, he says it wasn't because they were large in number. He said, yeah, actually, you were very few in number. It was because, are you ready for this? It was because, according to verse 8, God loved them. He chose them because he loved them. That is to say, God chose to set his affection upon the Jewish people simply because he's God, and that's what he decided to do. In other words, he loved them because he loved them. He loved them because he chose to love them. This is the same principle of divine sovereign election of individuals. God chose Israel because this is who he sovereignly decided to love with a special kind of affection. He hasn't told us more than that, just as he hasn't told us why he chose us to be his people. And how often throughout his word, God has affirmed his special love for the Jewish people and the nation of Israel. For example, Isaiah 43, verse 4, the beginning of verse 4, since you are precious in my sight, since you are honored and I love you. And even during Israel's darkest days, times when she doubted and questions God, God's love for her, God's concern for her, God in his mercy reaffirmed to her his love, his faithfulness, his loyalty to her with these amazing words from Isaiah 49 verses 14 through 16. But Zion says, this is the Jewish people speaking collectively in very dark days, the Lord has forsaken me. The Lord has forgotten me. That's what Israel felt like. That's what the Jewish people cried out to God. You've forsaken us. You've forgotten us. And here's God's response. Can a woman forget her nursing child and have no compassion on the son of her womb? Even these may forget, but I, I will not forget you. Behold, I have inscribed you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are continually before me. Again, God speaks of his love for Israel in Jeremiah 31, 3. The Lord appeared to him from afar, saying, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have drawn you with loving kindness. In this verse, God says that his love for Israel is everlasting. It means it's continuous. It never ends. It continues even in spite of Israel's rebellion, her stiff-necked stubbornness to go her own way, and even her national rejection of Jesus as Messiah. And Paul, the Apostle Paul, writing in Romans 11 about how God will faithfully keep his promises of salvation to Israel. How? By bringing the remaining remnant of Jewish people who survived the tribulation. He will bring them to saving faith in Jesus. That's the meaning of all Israel will be saved. Not every single Jewish person who's ever lived will be saved. That's not, that's not accurate. No one is saved because they're Jewish. They're saved because of their faith in Jesus as their savior. But Paul says that God will keep his promise to save Israel by doing this with a small remnant of Jews who survived the tribulation period. They're the ones who will be saved and they represent the whole nation. Paul said in Romans 11, 26 and 27, so all Israel will be saved. Just as it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion, meaning Christ. He'll remove ungodliness from Jacob. This is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. That's the, the new covenant when Israel will be converted. And having said this, the apostle then, note this, he immediately tells us what our attitude, our attitude as believers, should be towards the Jewish people in Israel today, while they are presently, the vast majority, in unbelief. Romans 11, 28 and 29, from the standpoint of the gospel, they're enemies for your sake. But from the standpoint of God's choice, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers, for the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Though today, most Jewish people do reject Christ and the gospel. There is a blindness that has covered their hearts and minds. Paul says they remain, though, beloved for the sake of the fathers. Who are the fathers? The patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, because it was to them that God made promises to bring Israel into existence and to bless her like no other nation has ever been blessed. Notice again what Paul states in verse 29, for the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. 
In other words, God's promises are unchangeable. It doesn't matter if Israel has rebelled against him and are presently enemies of the gospel. He loves her. He's going to save her because he promised to save her. And that's why we are to love the Jewish people because they are beloved by him, even though they oppose the gospel right now. Folks, if we are going to be obedient to the word of God, then we must love the Jewish people because God has set his loving affection upon them. And as I said before, whatever God loves, his children are to love too. But in addition, there's a second reason as to why we are to love and support the Jewish people and the nation of Israel, and it's this. Because God has promised to bless those who bless the Jewish people, and he has promised to curse those who curse the Jewish people. And the passage of scripture that tells us this is a classic, important, critically significant passage, Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Now the Lord said to Abram, go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you, and I'll make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, and so you shall be a blessing. And I'll bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Now, these verses are known as the Abrahamic covenant because they, are, they contain promises made to Abraham from God. And, and they're made not only to Abraham as an individual, but Abraham as an individual and to his descendants, to his seed. There are five specific promises that God made to Abraham and his descendants. And I want you to know they are unconditional Meaning that God will fulfill them regardless of the Jewish people's response. It doesn't depend upon them. It is unconditional in that it depends solely upon him. Promise number one, I'll make you a great nation. Now at the time this promise was made, oh, it seemed so improbable. And so improbable that Abraham would become a great nation. Why? Because the man was 75 years old and his wife Sarah was barren. They had no children. But God was faithful to his word. And from Abraham came Isaac, and from Isaac came Jacob, and from Jacob came 12 sons, and from these 12 sons came a great nation, the 12 tribes of Israel. Promise number two, I will bless you. This is the promise that God would ultimately bless Abraham by making him prosperous, and God did that. God did that. Abraham did become a man of great wealth, accumulating many possessions. Promise number three, and make your name great. I'm going to make your name great, Abraham, like, like the great men of the world. And God fulfilled this promise, too, just, just as he said. The proof of this is that today, Abraham is revered by three major religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. They all revere Abraham. Promise number four, and so you shall be a blessing. This promise was fulfilled by the fact that Abraham has become a blessing to all believers in Christ. You may not recognize that, but it's true. Because he, Abraham, was an illustration of what saving faith was all about. God said in the Old Testament that Abraham believed God and it was credited to righteousness for him. Abraham shows us, by his example, what it means to be justified by faith in Christ. In fact, this is the very point that the Apostle Paul makes in Romans 4, where he teaches that God credited righteousness to Abraham on the basis of faith. Notice what Paul says in chapter 4 of Romans, verses 23 and 24. Not for his sake only was it written that it was credited to him, but for our sake also to whom it will be credited as those who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. So Abraham has been a great blessing to you and to millions who have followed his example of faith in the one true God, and specifically faith in Christ for salvation. Justification by faith. Abraham is the example. But in addition, Abraham has also been a great, great blessing because of what God told him at the end of verse 3. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. This is that magnificent promise that one of Abraham's descendants, one of his sons, would be the Messiah who would bless all the families of the earth, not just the Jewish families, but all the families of the earth by bringing salvation to people all over the world. 
And of course, this was fulfilled in that Jesus, Abraham's greatest son, was born Jewish and secured salvation by his substitutionary death on the cross. Now, so far we looked at four promises God made to Abraham, but it is the fifth promise that tells us why it is so important for us to love and support Israel. It's found at the beginning of verse 3. And I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you, I will curse. God made an unconditional promise to Abraham that those who blessed him and his descendants, they indeed would be blessed by God. And those who cursed him and his descendants, indeed, they would be cursed by God. And folks, history has revealed that God keeps his word. Consider the nations of the world who have cursed the Jewish people by mistreating them. For example, in the 15th and 16th century, Spain was Europe's premier nation. Nobody would even debate that. But in the year 1492, that famous year that Columbus sailed the ocean blue, it was also the year that King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella of Spain expelled all of the Jews from their country. That's why they settled along the Mediterranean. They settled in, in uh, Arab countries, North African countries, Greece. That, that's why they were kicked out of Spain in 1492. And today, Spain, though it may be a nice place to visit, it's no longer a great nation on the world scene. N nobody is that concerned about Spain. You don't read about Spain being a political power. Her fleet, her armada, was destroyed by Great Britain in the year 1588, and Spain is now considered a very weak nation amongst the nations of the world. What about Germany? Has Germany been cursed for her treatment of the Jewish people with the Holocaust? Yes. Yes, she has. Although Germany is still somewhat of a major political player on the world scene, she has suffered greatly in her mistreatment of the Jewish people. One scholar writing about the curses on Germany wrote this. He said, <coughs> a similar analysis of Germany's great loss in her reducing the Jewish population to 0.06% shows that major cities lost up to 80% of their qualified physicians and that the worlds of music and science were irreversibly reduced by the German defeat in World War II. Racism of any kind undermines and undercuts the vitality of any culture, but anti-Semitism is a particularly vicious and fiendish blow to the well-being of any society." End of quote. And along that same line of thought, it may surprise you to know that Great Britain, the United Kingdom, once the leading empire of her day under Queen Victoria to the point that it used to be said of England that the sun never sets on the British Empire. But that can't be said of her today. Nobody says that today because it isn't true. England has been greatly reduced in her status amongst the nations of the world, and I propose to you that it is because of her mistreatment of the Jewish people. You see, at one time, England was a great friend to the Jewish people. During the 1800s and the early 1900s, England was a nation filled with many godly believers who loved the Jewish people and longed for them to have a homeland of their own in the Middle East. In fact, in 1917, when the English defeated the Ottoman Turks and their vast empire, that area, that area of the world known as Palestine, then came under British rule. It had been under Ottoman Turk rule for about 400 years, but it came under British rule, and Great Britain then made a moral promise to the Jewish people that she would do everything in her power to provide and facilitate a homeland for them in Palestine. In what is known today as the Balfour Declaration, named after Lord Arthur Balfour, the Foreign Secretary of England at the time, Great Britain made the following official statement on behalf of their prime minister and their government. Here's what it said, word for word. His Majesty's government views with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people and will use their best endeavors to facilitate the achievement of this objective. It being clearly understood that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of non-Jewish communities in Palestine or the rights and political status enjoyed by Jews in any other country. So England then promised to facilitate the achievement of a homeland for the Jewish people in Palestine. But she never fulfilled her promise. 
In fact, five years later, after the Balfour Declaration, five years following that declaration, soon after the end of World War I, the League of Nations, which was a precursor to the United Nations, gave a mandate, not a suggestion, a mandate to Great Britain to follow through on her promise to facilitate a homeland for the Jewish people. But again, she didn't. Folks, just the opposite was true. The British government turned against the Jewish people and worked very hard to keep them from becoming a nation. Marv Rosenthal, a leading Jewish Christian and a man who years ago kindly befriended me, he explained in an article that he wrote how and why England turned its back on the Jewish people. Marv Rosenthal wrote this, he said, in the midst of politics, with a far greater Arab population in the Middle East, with the increased interest in oil, with movement away, uh, or movement rather towards the Second World War, the Balfour Declaration and the League of Nations mandate to Great Britain were all but forgotten. In 1939, succumbing to Arab pressure, Britain published the infamous White Papers, which restricted Jewish immigration to 1,500 people a month, less than a drop in the bucket. And this at the time when the Eastern European population was being decimated by Hitler. Following the war, survivors of the Holocaust, using whatever mode of transportation possible, try to make their way to Israel. The British, rigidly enforcing the White Papers, would capture Jews seeking to enter Israel and send them back to Europe or confine them on the island of Cyprus, allowing only 1,500 per month to enter the land. But still, the Jews came, and finally, unable to quell the disturbances between the Jew and Arab, Britain turned the matter over to the United Nations. Today, Great Britain is a morally, economically, and militarily bankrupt nation. In the day Great Britain issued the Balfour Declara Declaration, she was probably the strongest nation in history. Oh, how the mighty have fallen. She had a moral and legal right to help establish a homeland for the Jew, but because of political considerations, she reneged on her promise. <coughs> for nations and individuals, the word of God still stands, and I will bless them that bless you and curse them that curse you. Now let me add a few important points concerning Israel as a homeland for the Jewish people that I, I think will help put things in perspective for you. England's failure, failure to facilitate a homeland for the Jewish people in, in Palestine wasn't simply a moral failure on their part. It was that, but not only that. Nor was it primarily a political issue, though it was that, but not only that. It was primarily a failure to understand a critically important biblical issue. That issue being that Almighty God he promised Abraham and his descendants, the Jewish people, that spot of real estate in the Middle East over 4,000 years ago. Genesis chapter 13, verses 14 through 17 spells it out clearly. The Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, now lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are, northward and southward and eastward and westward, for all the land... <coughs> all the land which you see, I will give it to you and to your descendants forever. I'll make your descendants as the dust of the earth so that if anyone can number the dust of the earth, then your descendants can also be numbered. Arise, walk about the land through its length and breadth, for I will give it to you. Regardless, folks, of what's being claimed today by the vast majority of Arabs, and in particular, Hamas terrorists, that land... That, space, that spot of real estate doesn't belong to the followers of Muhammad. It belongs to the Jewish people, and it belongs to them by divine right. In fact, it may surprise you to learn that at the time of the Balfour Declaration, we're talking about 1917, about that time, a number of Arab leaders were in favor of a Jewish state being established on that spot of land. None less than Hussein ibn Ali, that name may not mean much to you, but you know the name of his descendants. His descendants are the rulers of the modern nation of Jordan. They're, they're all the King Husseins. The modern King Hussein, his great, great, whatever grandfather goes back to Hussein ibn Ali. This man said these words. We saw the Jews streaming into Palestine from Russia, Germany, Austria, Spain, America. The cause of causes could not escape those who had the, the gift of deeper insight. They know 
that the country was for its original sons, for all their differences, a sacred and beloved homeland. It might also interest you to know that in the late 1940s, the United Nations offered to partition the Holy Land. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> they offered to partition the Holy Land into two nations, one Arab and one Jewish. The Jewish people accepted it. But the Arab nations of the world rejected that proposal. So they were offered then a Palestinian state alongside of a Jewish state. But they refused it. Why? Because they hated the thought of Jewish people living beside them. They wanted the whole region for themselves, which is exactly what they still want today. So why do we love? Why do we support? Why do we pray for Israel? Because God promises to bless those who bless them and curse those who curse them. And all of us want God's blessings. Listen, how you and I treat Israel and the Jewish people, how we think about them, that's important to God, and it affects us personally. As I said, this is not a neutral issue. It's not a political issue. It's a moral issue. It is a biblical issue. Now, there are a number of more reasons that I could give for loving and supporting the Jewish people in Israel. Time will not allow it, so I'm just going to mention them briefly. We support Israel because, as Christians, we are indebted to the Jewish people. They're the ones who preserve for us the Holy Scriptures. Paul said in Romans 3, unto them were given the oracles of God. They were entrusted with the Word of God, the written Scriptures, and they preserved it for us so that we might have our precious Bibles. And it was Jewish Christians, I remind you, who faithfully brought the gospel to the Gentile world. They didn't distort it. They faithfully brought the gospel to the Gentile world. And it was Jesus of Nazareth, the Jewish Messiah, to whom we owe everything, everything. But in addition, we should love and support the Jewish people in Israel because God has a great future in store for them. They will not be destroyed. Regardless of the fact that the Bible says that all the nations of the world will turn against them, and that has to include the United States at some point. Scripture teaches that at the end of the tribulation period, God will pour out his grace of salvation upon Israel. They'll finally see the truth that Jesus was their beloved son who they murdered, and they will weep as one weeps for an only begotten son, and God will pour out his grace upon them, take away the blindness of their eyes, It'll be removed and the remaining remnant of the Jewish people alive at that time will see the truth and will weep in repentance and trust Jesus as Savior, Lord, and Messiah. And then Jesus will establish his kingdom on earth where Israel will have a prominent role because the Bible said that the apostles will help the Lord in governing the 12 tribes of Israel. What exactly that looks like, I don't know. But whatever it is, it means that Israel has a prominent part in the millennial kingdom with the 12 apostles right there with Jesus ruling over them. So I exhort you to love the Jewish people in Israel. Support them. Pray for them. Someday they will be your brothers and sisters in Christ because they will believe in Jesus. The question is, do you? Do you believe in him? We've been talking about Israel. We've been talking about Jesus bringing salvation. But do you have you believed on Christ for your salvation? Have you ever repented of your sin, turned to Christ, and placed your trust in him to save you from your sin? He died on the cross to save sinners. That's what this whole season is about. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Sinners like you, sinners like me. So come to him today. Let him save you. If you'd like to speak to one of our pastors about this, then just see me as we close the service. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you that we have been able to study this today. I pray it has been enlightening, informative, but, but mostly, Lord, I pray that you have tugged at the heart of your people, that they now realize the issues and their minds have been transformed by the word of God. Lord, we, we love the Jewish people. <clears throat> we stand with them. We support Israel. We pray for this 
horrible war to come to an end. We don't want to see casualties on either side, but we do want to see terrorism defeated. We do pray for Hamas to be wiped out. We do pray it will be destroyed. We do pray, Lord, that on both sides of the aisles that, that there would be people who'd come to faith in, in Christ. We do pray, Lord, bring peace to Jerusalem. Bring peace to your ancient covenant people. And may we, Lord, may we be zealous to share the gospel with the sons and daughters of Jacob. And may there be many who come to faith in you, even before the tribulation. We also pray for those here, those perhaps watching on live stream who may not know you. We pray that you'll bring them to yourself, that they'll finally, finally repent of their sin and turn to Christ to save them. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.